three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We all know we the Apollo 11 mission that marks the first successful journey to the moon and back in human history in 1969. It was an incredible event that became the unofficial capstone of the historic space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. However, the Americans and the Russians didn't stop advancing aerospace engineering after the moon landing. Eight years later, in 1977, the US completed the first manned flight of the Space Shuttle Enterprise, the world's first reusable low-orbital space shuttle. The Soviet Union took notice and began work on the Buran Space Shuttle. While the history of the Buran was marred by the collapse of the Soviet Union, the question still remains. Did the Soviets build a better space shuttle? Enterprise and the Space Shuttle The US completed the Enterprise in 1977, but they had been working on the project since 1969. This original model was built without a heat shield for re-entry. It used electrochemical fuel cells that didn't have enough charge for sustained flights, and its landing gear was primitive. With these limitations, the US Enterprise was unable to complete the mission of orbiting the Earth. However, that was all by design. Instead, the Enterprise was used to gather test data to guide the construction of the next space shuttle. Although the Soviet Union was trailing behind by five years, any information they could gain on the Enterprise program would help steer their development in new directions. The Soviet Union already had an aerospace program that could provably rival the US, beating the Americans to one of the first space milestones with their launch of Sputnik 1 on October 4, 1957, putting the world's first artificial satellite into orbit. Sputnik relayed signals to the Earth for three weeks before its power supply ran out, but it stayed in the skies for two more months before re-entering the atmosphere. By the late 1960s, the Soviets had experimented with reusable spacecraft with their Burya, a high-altitude tactical bomber that was quickly scrapped in favour of developing intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver nukes instead. The building of the Enterprise struck fear into the Soviet military. While the US was publicly discussing the scientific value of their space missions, the Soviets thought it was all a ploy for military development. Multiple sources speculated that the US shuttle could enter and exit the atmosphere like a whale in the ocean, diving down to drop a nuke before rising back into the safety of space. Another outlandish idea theorized that the Enterprise would be used to install a laser weapon in orbit, which could destroy missiles from space. OKB-1's OK new rocket and proposals While those sci-fi ideas didn't manifest in the space race era, the Soviets took on the task of engineering their own shuttles. It all began with a proposal from Soviet engineer Valentin Glushko and his company OKB-1. They designed a new heavy lift rocket dubbed the RLA. This new rocket would use a fuel blend that included liquid hydrogen and kerosene, which was ignited with injections of liquid oxygen. These elements are abundant, but they are normally gaseous. To turn the oxygen and hydrogen gases into liquids, the fuels and oxidizers had to be kept very cold and under extremely high pressures. This technology was new to the Soviets and it would prove to be a major step forward for their space program. The RLA could carry a number of different vehicles or weapons into space, but engineers at OKB-1 had visions of competing with the US space shuttle program. In 1975, they designed two possible crafts to pair with the RLA. The first was the reusable vertical landing transport ship, which used a lifting body design. This type of plane is optimized for reducing drag on the wings. Astronauts in traditional space capsules had almost no control over where they landed. The lifting body could fix this problem by almost removing the wings or changing them into non-traditional forms to give pilots greater control upon re-entry. This type of body would be used extensively and even into the turn of the century. Examples of vehicles using this body type include the HL-20 personnel launch system from 1990 and the 2015 ESA Intermediate Experimental Vehicle. The second vehicle designed to pair with the RLA was the Orbital Spaceplane 120. Weighing 120 tons, the Orbital Spaceplane had a design much like the Enterprise. 
Instead of a lifting body, this model opted for delta wings, a detachable external tank and boosters just like the US model. In another twist, neither of these designs would make the cut. Instead, designers went for the Orbital Ship 92. This model had a different rocket staging and the shuttle was equipped with two Solo VF D-30 bypass turbofan jet engines, so it could actually fly in the Earth's atmosphere prior to or after space flights. Copying the US? Despite the changes, the shuttle looked very much like the Enterprise. Some engineers wanted to innovate on the design and feared that a copy would look like they were trailing behind the US. However, initial wind tunnel testing proved the design was aerodynamically efficient and significant changes would postpone development, an unthinkable drawback since they were already lagging behind. That didn't stop the Monia Scientific Production Association from objecting to the design and throwing their hat into the ring with their own shuttle design. Thirteen years earlier, the Molnia Scientific Production Association was involved in the Spiral program, the Soviet's early attempt at an orbital space plane. This shuttle had a futuristic shape with a variety of unique features including foldable variable dihedral wings, the ability to completely separate from the booster rocket in case of emergency or failure, and it used niobium alloy scale plate armour with ceramic bearings, which allowed the plates to expand during the increasing temperatures on re-entry. However, while this craft was unique, the US-based model had proven success, so the designers chose to build a shuttle based on the US Enterprise. Project Buran Underway Five years after work began on Project Buran, the craft was finally under construction. As the project progressed, engineers created numerous small-scale models to test various aspects of the craft. Four years later, in 1984, the first Buran was completed and testing began at the Gromov Flight Research Institute. Dubbed the OKGLI, OK the plane began tests by taking off from runways using its jet engines and then gliding back down for its landing to test the handling of the space plane. After 24 flights, the plane needed maintenance to continue with this type of testing. So instead, the program leaders began testing plans for lifting the plane into the air for a horizontal takeoff, which was the test method already used by the US. The plan wouldn't come to fruition during this phase of testing, but it did result in the creation of the Antonov AN-225 Maria, the heaviest plane ever made. After the testing phase concluded, researchers began selecting crew members for the shuttle named Orbiter K-1, the crown jewel of the Buran project. Igor Volk was selected to be the commander of the first Buran mission, but he wasn't eligible to helm the plane when he was first chosen. The Soviet Union had a rule that all space missions must include one crew member who had been to space before. The commander, Igor Volk, would have to go to space first. He would check off that box during the mission dubbed Soyuz T-12, which also marked the first spacewalk by a woman. The Buran project's chosen backup commander was test pilot and cosmonaut Anatoly Levchenko. On November 15, 1988, the Orbiter K-1 Buran was launched on its first orbital mission from Baikonur Cosmodrome. There was no crew on board. Instead, the shuttle was remote controlled to test its capacity for multiple uses and ensure that takeoff and re-entry were smooth. The Buran successfully entered outer space and flew around the world twice, completing a total orbit distance of 52,013 miles in just over three hours. Buran then landed at the same base it was launched from. The mission was a success, but the Soviet Union was entering a time of upheaval. Three years later, the Soviet Union dissolved and Project Buran was cancelled. The shuttle was stored in a base for a little over 10 years until it was destroyed in 2002 when its storage hangar collapsed. The Buran Space Shuttle had a rocky start, but it did innovate on the successful US design, at least on paper. It's hard to say whether it actually beat the US model since it never actually served its purpose as a reusable vehicle to take crews into space and back. The US would go on to build five more orbital shuttles, and each iteration was better than the last, while the Soviet Union only ended up with the Buran. 
However, its history and technical design are still important milestones in the world of aviation. Do you think the Buran beat the US shuttles? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more content coming your way soon. Thanks for watching.